The great writer Mina Alexander says, the act of writing, it seems to me, makes up a shelter, allows space to what would otherwise be hidden, crossed out, or mutilated. Sometimes writing can walk toward a reparation, making a shared space for the mind. Yet it feeds off rough search, tears in what might otherwise seem a seamless, oppressive fabric. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and also good morning and good afternoon to the other parts of the world. Today, we have an evening lecture, and to deliver this lecture, we have someone who Professor Manu Bangate calls the timeless entity, the universal man. He is someone who does not need any kind of special introduction, but then just to brief you all about him, his name is Mr. Tenjin Sundu, a very popular name, not only in India, but also abroad. Mr. Tenjin Sundu was born to a Tibetan refugee family in India. He is a Tibetan writer and an activist. The author of four books of poetry and stories, he has won the first ever Picado Outlook Nonfiction Contest in 2002. He is now working on his fifth, a book of Tibetan refugee stories. Sundu solely lives off his writing by selling his self-published books. Sundu was a red bandana as a symbol of his childhood place that he would walk every single day until Tibet regains its independence. He lives in a rented room in Dharamshala, Himachal Pradesh, North India. As a refugee living between the dream of tomorrow and the reality of today, he says that he finds the life of an exile extremely fascinating and often wonder about what he calls the exile nation. He says that he believes exile makes one imaginative, creative, and resourceful in adaptation. He has also been exploring the issues of identity, culture, belongingness, and the mass and the individual behavior. And he says the world which he is seeing at the moment is in a way kind of an entanglement, a kind of an entity which he appears to in a way discern the very meaning. Sir, we are absolutely honored to host you here and looking forward to hearing to you. Over to you, Tenzin, sir. Okay, so thank you very much, um, the organizers. Um, I'm really happy that I'm taking part in this um, as a speaker uh, today. Sorry to interrupt um, you, sir. You are not visible. Um, yeah, I'm okay. No, sir, you are not visible. Okay, let me just check. Yeah, no? Yes, sir. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, very much. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. So, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much, uh, the organizers, uh, getting me on this. Uh, live lecture series. Um, today I'm going to speak about freedom and poetry, um, finding your own voice. Um, I'll be speaking um, as a writer and I will be sharing some of my own experiences as a writer, how I started. And I think um, many of you will uh, relate with me because I, I write in English and uh, in India English is our second language and how how does the journey um, uh, go about where does it start um, and the and and all the stories in between so uh, my name is Tenzin Sundu I am a Tibetan writer and an activist based here in Dharamshala in Himachal Pradesh um, Generally, when I when I go around in, in India, uh, people look at my face because I look different from what is called the mainstream uh, Indian population. You know, people uh, say all sorts of different kind of names, and uh, they, and this happens daily, every day. Uh, Ching Chong, Ping Pong, Hey uh, Jackie Chan, um, and all sorts of sorts of names. And uh, this comes from a very narrow-minded way of looking at. The, the diversity, the richness of India. Um, uh, so I think one of, one of my first writings uh, in English was about identity. Uh, how, how, how do I look? How do I present myself? And how I think 
other people look at me and in one of my um, first writings uh, i've written this line uh, which which said i am more of an indian except for my chinky tibetan face um i live here in dharamshala now dharamshala is a small uh, place uh, in himachal pradesh north india and at the moment there is a lot of rain going on so there is rain and sunshine taking turns to entertain us so it's quite wet outside um, and sometimes it's it's uh, it's bright sun uh, this will go on for uh, one more month till the middle of september is going to go on uh, like this and dharamshala receives second highest amount of rain um that the place dharamshala um, because it's a small hill town here uh when i go around in in india many people actually don't know dharamshala so when i say um i'm from dharamshala people ask me which dharamshala because in india in india there are thousands and millions of dharamshalas uh, but this is dharamshala the place where his holiness the dalai lama lives tibetan government exile is also based here and uh you know one of the distinctions is dharamshala receives second highest amount of rain after cherapunji so um so abilash uh, next to your place from there uh, you know cherapunji um but here we get so much of rain yes sir uh, very true and, yeah and this is this is the rainy season and so much of rain here um and as i'm i'm sure some of the audience here you must have come to dharamshala you've seen uh, but if you haven't if you plan to wish to come here um my advice is uh, do not come here uh, with cheap chinese umbrellas you know they'll go tatters in in the, in the torrential dharamshala rain you need uh, strong umbrellas from jalandhar oh lambi uh, badi wali ch- uh, chatri woh lagega aapko So um to start with I'd like to read a poem uh, uh it's called when it rains in dharamshala and it's fitting because we are experiencing a uh, monsoon all across the country and I'd like to read this poem called when it rains in dharamshala so this is my kind of a tribute to dharamshala which is the capital of tibetans living uh, in exile um and and from here I'm I'm going to go on uh, speaking about how do you write and uh how do you catch what do you include what do you exclude um so so all of that uh, so this is a poem uh, when it rains in dharamshala when it rains in dharamshala rain drops wear boxing gloves thousands of them come crashing down and beat my room under its tin roof my room cries from inside wets my bed my papers Sometimes the clever rain comes from behind my room the treacherous walls lift their heels and allow a small flood into my room i sit on i sit on my island nation bed and watch my country in flood notes on freedom memoirs of my prison days letters from college friends and crumbs of bread and maggi noodles rice sprightly to the surface like a sudden recovery of a forgotten memory three months of torture monsoon in the needle-leaved pines himalaya rinsed clean glistens in the evening sun until the rain calms down and stops beating my room i need to console my tin roof who has been on duty from the british raj this room has sheltered many homeless people now captured by mongooses and mice lizards and spiders and partly rented by me a rented room for a home is a humbling existence my kashmiri land lady my kashmiri land lady at 80 cannot return home we often compete for beauty kashmir or tibet every evening i return to my rented room but i'm not going to die this way there has got to be some way out of here i cannot cry my, like my room i have cried enough in prisons and in small moments of despair there has got to be some way out of here i cannot cry my room is wet enough now this is a poem uh, written uh, a couple of years ago uh, this is a 
it's, it's a rented house. Uh, so then, you know, you know, what happens is for, for a writer, uh, the writer is, is keenly observing things around your life and and um, is, is is selecting what are the things that will go into my writing it's like like a cook you know there are many ingredients that are available you cannot put all the ingredients at the same time at the same time there, there is also a need of a balance and exactly which ingredient will go at what point of time at how much heat um, and what needs to go before that and how should the stirring happen? All of that is uh, how a poet actually looks into uh, the general mundane day-to-day life and makes the selection and uh, does the cooking uh, together. So when I was um, um, staying in that house, I now moved to another house, which is also uh, not very different from the previous house. So I saw that, you know, it's, it's an old British bungalow owned by a family. And now, um, and now uh, being uh, run by me um, as a tenant, uh, and and still owned by an Indian family. So I saw this beautiful uh, kind of a, a contradiction. Um, at the same time, the beauty of it being there and how things could be. Now, therefore. Um, so in, in the writing, one is constantly in search of materials uh, to write. Um, one of the things that I had always uh, kept very uh, close to mind is, um, you know, um, as, a, as a writer, one must be reading. Reading is so very essential and important because that is the source of inspiration for both writing as well as ideas uh, narrative constructions you're doing. Um, but for me, writing is more important than reading. Of course, it begins from reading. Uh, so for me, what, what happened is as a student of English literature and uh, English literature as, as the legacy of the British Empire, uh, which is still going on, one of the most uh, popular uh, courses in BA, MA, uh, uh, you know, courses all across uh, the country. Um, in these courses, even today, I have noticed, sadly, there's very little teaching on writing, inspiring uh, our students to write. But the constant pressure is to read what had been written hundreds, thousands of years ago, and then there is a test to show how much you have retained from that reading and your analysis. So there is there is little or 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 zero uh, education on writing or training, and and um, unless there is a specific uh, writing courses, creative writing courses, as a part of English literature, there is no direct course to teach. Uh, writing, which I think is more important, because what we are reading is what had re- what had been written in the history, and when we read what had been written in the past, we seem to be emulating or learning or catching on the old phrases and idioms that that is now history, archaic languages, and old uh, world perspectives. So it is important to read, but it's more important to be taught how to write. Only then can we write our story. Now, our story, whether it's a village story or urban story or a story of mixed marriages or story of um, unity and diversity that we all talk about, uh, that new Indian voice is so very important in this country. Uh, So therefore, today when we talk about um, writing, uh, for me, it is important to tell your own story. Now, how do you tell your own story? How to recognize? Uh, I think one of the things that had been um, taught in in Asia, in um, in the Indian uh, community, and also in my community, uh, Tibetan community, very often there is so little emphasis on, on you. It's all about our society and all people together or, or to your religious leaders or to 
to what is called the famous people. Uh, there's very little, little recognition to the self. Um, so when there's no recognition to the self, um, you know, the, the, the voice is never found. And in order to find that, that your inner voice, it is important to uh, at least have this, uh, that we are all equal democracy, that we are all equal and we all have a unique perspective. Yeah, we live different life. We uh, are or in, in some schools and colleges and universities, many places. We may be living kind of a similar lifestyle. So we get lost into the averageness, into the mundaneness. Um, but you know, what is writable is our own unique perspective. And once you recognize that I look at things differently and that uh, can be written, that a unique perspective can be written. That is the beginning of, uh, of of recognizing yourself. And once you recognize that unique uh, voice, um, you know, as a writer, then you are constantly in search of conscience for writing. Uh, how do you look at things differently? Um, and um, and in your observation, do you uh, do you get at more attracted to the events or the experience? or the details of the color, shape, or what other people said, how you felt at that moment. I think these are the more, uh, these, are, these are the things that go into uh, making content uh, for, your, for your writing. So therefore, um, uh, one of the points that I want to emphasize here again is, um, is the importance to, uh, to really draft, create a whole new course into, in, in writing. Um, as part of uh, English literatures, whether it's BA or MA or whatever, whatever level, there should be equal emphasis in writing. Then we can truly create a country of writers. I want to uh, make that uh, emphasis here. Now, uh, for me, uh, I'm I'm not just writing um, prose. Uh, I'm, I particularly love writing poetry. Um, but then I, I think uh, the common experience among all the uh, second language English uh, writers is, uh, you know, firstly, we, we are not even fluent speaking or writing English. You know, I had terrible time in my uh, in my school. And of course, my school, because ours was a Tibetan refugee school, less facility and, and no, uh, not the best uh, group of teachers, very enthusiastic and hardworking but uh, even uh, not good enough uh, to train uh, us into writing. So I had always wanted to write, but I didn't have the language. And so it was only later in university um, that I started to write. And, and, and uh, for a writer, it's very late uh, when you're writing only, uh, only in, uh, you know, at the university level. It doesn't mean that you cannot write, but you, one can start to write at any age, whatever stage. Uh, but I really wished uh, that I, I that I could uh, start to write much earlier, uh, because for me, uh, from childhood, we had always known that our country had been, uh, you know, occupied by a foreign country. Uh, China had uh, occupied Tibet, and we were we had been living in India as as refugees. So there was always an urgent need to talk about our problem, our situation, our story. And uh, there was international apathy uh, to Tibet. You know, nobody nobody knows about Tibet. No one, nobody uh, even wants to know because everybody wants to trade with China, and and that's the kind of a benefit. So I, I would always wanted to write about uh, you know uh, these uh, conditions of life, but I didn't have the language, and um, English language was the thing that I had always wanted to write in. Um, so therefore. Uh, it was only after uh, my graduation and then then in post graduation that I started to start to write and um, I had some of my very good uh, classmates who with whom I started to uh, you know experiment in in writing so see um, the people you you uh, you study with people you live with are hugely influential um, in in shaping your mind in giving you uh, the new language uh, for me right when we say writing it is not just the a language in which you want to write, you also need the language of writing. 
um, is not the English language or Assamese or uh, Marathi or Bengali or uh, Tamil or Telugu or Malayalam or Tibetan, whatever. Um, besides the physical language you write in, you also need um, the poetic language with which one can imagine and think. Um, so, and one of the common experiences uh, is, uh, I think uh, it is common experience with uh, most of younger generation uh, in, in India that uh, today we are, we are scattered. Individually, we are scattered in so many different languages. Yeah, uh, those, those of us who are writing in English, for us, our mother tongue is something else. Uh, but we are writing in English. We may be more comfortable reading and writing English, but uh, at home or the language uh, in which you dream or think most often is your own mother tongue. And therefore, you are, you are not uh, expert in your mother tongue. At the same time, you are, uh, you, are, uh, you are writing and reading in English and you are not expert in, in English also. Uh, so there are these, um, you know, uh, dissipated uh, lives, uh, scattered lives, scattered in so many different languages. You know, for example, um, you know, I write and read English, but I think I live in Tibetan language. Um, and uh, and Hindi is my survival language. Wherever I go in, in India, so uh, Hindi so that hindi is there and then i i went to madras for my uh, college I, I studied in loyola college in madras at that time it was called madras. so I, so the word madras is uh, stuck with me uh, so and because of that um, i i picked up uh, tamil See, so, so I go into uh, Tamil at, at one point. So you now you see how, how scattered we are in so many different languages and expressions. And so how does the, how does the expression come about? Yeah. Sometimes if you want to abuse someone, you feel I am uh, I am better in Tamil because Tamil abuse languages are like fantastic. It's such a rich, rich vocabulary. But Tibetan uh, abuse languages are not much use. Uh, they're not effective enough, actually. Uh, and but then I feel uh, in, in writing nuanced ideas, I feel uh, English is uh, English is more comfortable. At least I, fi I find uh, more comfortable and more nuanced uh, writings I could uh, come about. So you see where, where where things are placed. And this, I think, is a common experience with many uh, younger generation Indians uh, today. Of course, uh, there are elements of nationalism, you know, uh, Hindi bhasha, Tamil bhasha, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but a situation has also shaped uh, India in the way it has uh, today. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons why I am writing today uh, is is the necessity to express, um, and so therefore it has always been a desire for me to to write from childhood. But not having the language, I was not able to write uh, from so early uh, in age. Uh, only much uh, later. Now, uh, poetry is important for me because for me, poetry uh, with poetry you can you can speak. In a, in a very different language. Um, because poetry is the language of imagination. Um, and uh, and in, in, in the language of, in the composition of language imagination, you are using metaphors, you are using, um, you know, images, you are using music. Yeah, you are music. Uh, you are, uh, so these are the things that make your language so very rich and explain in, 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 in so much of uh, gravity, depth, that uh, sometimes you are able to speak uh, your soul um, in, in poetry, which uh, you cannot do in common day-to-day -day, uh, prosaic uh, uh, language. Um, I think one, one of the strengths of, of writing poetry, uh, and that I always believe very strongly, 
is uh, because when you write poetry, when you compose poetry, you know, over a long period of time, you have been uh, having certain ideas and you're looking for these words and when when all these uh, things uh, come together, fall in place, when the when a poem is finally done, um, you know, it, it, it then becomes so powerful. And, and I always believe that poetry is the, is the most powerful uh, agent of change. You know, uh, politicians think that their promises will change people's minds or terrorists or dictators think that their, their threats to say, you do this or, or else I'm going to kill you. You know, that kind of a threat. They think that they are powerful. Or rich people think um, by luring people, that they think they can change people's mind by making promises to uh, to pay money or or get things done cheaply. But I believe uh, that, um, you know, poetry is the most powerful agent of change because once you change people's mind with poetry, uh, people change lovingly and forever. Because uh, what poetry does is that poetry touches the heart and changes the mind. Yeah, and this is my mantra. Uh, my mantra for poetry is poetry touches the heart and changes the mind. And, and people willingly change their mind once uh, you know, you read poetry and they, ch they change their mind forever. So therefore I'm saying poetry is the most powerful agent of change. But it takes so much of effort uh, in writing poetry, in telling the truth uh, and, and bringing that kind of a power of, of conviction that you carry and that you express uh, to other people. So for me, uh, that is poetry, and that is why uh, I consider uh, poetry as, as as the highest art and and such a pure, powerful uh, means and also expression. Uh, for me, poetry is not just this language of expression, for, uh, and uh, for me, it is poetry, more than language of expression. For me, poetry is um, poetry helps me in understanding. Poetry helps me in understanding the depth and the gravity. And so take this from me um, um, as, um, uh, as an experience that whenever you are in confusion, whenever you feel you are unable to understand, try to write. Because what happens is uh, when you write, you are able to go to the past Think of the present and uh, have a vision of the future. So writing helps you understand the confusion, the confusion. And then in itself will come about a solution. So writing has this uh, nature of uh, bringing the past, present and the future together and offering you uh, all the perspectives at the same time. So I think uh, these are the things that always helped me uh, in understanding um, and also uh, that therefore giving it a unique uh, articulation, which then comes out in the form of poetry. Um, I've spoken enough on writing and poetry, but um, I'm not just uh, the, the poet and the writer. I've, uh, I've been an activist in the Tibetan freedom movement for, for such a long time. And as an activist, um, I think my, my most important role is maintaining the strength of the Tibetan struggle from within the community to intellectually provide a kind of a leadership in, in the community and uh, constantly guard that and provide imaginative solutions, and which comes from poetry. Um, I'm, I'm not a leader or elected leader or any, anything like that in the, in the Tibetan community, but with my poetry, with my political activism, I've been able to, uh, uh, you know, help, help maintain this movement for some time and I'll continue to do that. And, and I find a highest satisfaction in being able to provide, uh, the, you know, this kind of assistance and my own participation in, in, the, in the freedom movement 
uh, in this way. Um, so, so then, what what does poetry, uh, you know, what does it do to me uh, in in writing? Uh, is uh, firstly, it helps me understand the situation, give uh, a sense of uh, articulation to it, and and then the activist uh, takes over. Activists, what the activist does is what had been written uh, is later then published, uh, presented, and also propagate to, to so many people, places, and with which we can champion uh, our cause. So, uh, um, so I am both the activist and also the poet. Um, um, and then, you know, uh, unlike many other people, I've never uh, taken a job as such, you know, job that uh, a salaried job i i always felt for me i have to be the volunteer uh, in the freedom movement i cannot be doing a job to earn a money um and also because um, i never felt the need to have a lot of money i live a very uh, small simple uh, you know simplified life right down to minimals um, i live a, a need based life uh, as an activist uh, just down to uh, to very simple life where I live in two pairs of shirts and and two pairs of jeans. I wear them in turns, and that's all my clothing. Um, and I live in a rented room here in Dharamshala with uh, three other friends. We all chip in uh, in running this place. Um, and luckily, I I didn't uh, get into um, starting. Uh, uh, my own family as such uh, so therefore you know my experiences are very, very uh, my uh, my expenses are very minimal and therefore very small income that i make in in selling this thin book of poems uh, a book of poems called kora i sell this or um, i get it printed very cheaply here in Dharamsal. i sell this and um, um, and with with whatever income I, I make out of this, with this I'm able to travel. I travel so much. So both the activist and the poet, I travel. I, in a year, I travel six months uh, continuously. Now, because of COVID, I'm not able to travel, but otherwise I travel so much. I talk about Tibet. I talk about writing. I inspire, I help inspire um, young people to uh, take interest in writing. Um, and uh, tells uh, Tibetan refugee stories and also seeks support uh, to the issue of Tibet. Um, so, so when I when I do this, whatever little income uh, that comes from my uh, sales of my book uh, goes into my work uh, as an activist. So I, I uh, fund myself and keep myself uh, free and independent in this way. So now you see uh, poetry is not just inspiration and articulation, it's a source of income, it's a livelihood for me, practical livelihood. So, um, and I also see, you know, um, you know, living uh, a life purely out of poetry, it's very rare. Um, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to live uh, a life purely out of, you know, 50 rupees a book, yeah. But I've been able to do because my economics is so very simple. Just uh, bare minimum uh, living. So this is how I uh, continue uh, working both as an activist um, and, and a writer. But, but the activist is not, uh, it's not just uh, sloganeering uh, or propagating. You know, I have done serious uh, interesting uh, cases where um, I've led hundreds, thousands of people uh, together in protest rallies and marches. Um, and there were many times when when I had to take up um, individual action, um, uh, you know, stunt actions. So I, I climbed buildings and prote protest when Chinese prime ministers um, were speaking in that kind of a building. So I, I got arrested. I got arrested so many times. Uh, uh, the first one happened in, in Bombay in, in the year 2002 and then next one in Bangalore. And and so many times. Um, so overall, I see that I've been to jail so many times. Um, I've been to jail 16 times, you know, one six, 16 times. So many of my classmates, my friends, they tell me um, because of my jail experiences, having gone to jail in Tihar jail in, in, in Delhi and Bombay and Goa, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Chennai, <laughs> so many places I've been to, been to, uh, been to jails. My friends tell me that I should write uh, jail guidebooks. Uh, because they say they say it'll be useful for Indian 
politicians who go who have to go to jail quite regularly uh, so it's funny um but uh, going to jail is not just um uh, uh just going there i think uh, going to jail you know a momentary heroism you know you get to speak in media and you, your pictures come in newspapers um these are just temporary i think the most difficult part is is fighting court cases you know, i have fought court cases in so many places in india uh, you 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 are willing to die but don't get into court cases because these court cases go on for years and years and years you know in one of my court cases in 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 bangalore my case went on for 11 years and i had to go to bangalore from dharamshala via delhi 37 times you know in this such such a long course of time you know you get irritated you get you know you feel like yaar kya kare isko bol do ki ab band kar do and you know at the end of at end of the 11 year course what happened to us then the court um, said um, we are fining you um, a sum of 5000 rupees tum bola yaar agar aapko 5000 hi chahiye to pehle shuruaat mein bol lete 5000 5000 rupees to no shuruaat se de dete so i felt like saying you should have said in the beginning you know you, you are fining me 5000 why do i have to come down to bangalore 37 times you know but then uh, you know uh, one of the ways in taking responsibility in political activism is you take the entire course together and this uh, makes you more patient in understanding that you are a part of a larger system the legal system of course there are many loopholes and many other uh, problems in 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 such a big country um, um but then taking responsibility to what you have done you know the political activism and and whatever and whatever the loopholes are you still undergo this patiently this for me um, is also uh, finding freedom F- uh, freedom for me uh, need necess- uh, most importantly is about being patient understanding and liberating yourself from the from the uh, irritability from your agitation from your aggression um uh, from your impatience from from intolerance becoming at least more tolerant or becoming more patient uh, and and genuinely having kindness these are for me path to freedom um very often we we um, and because i've been to jail very often you know idea of freedom in the jail is uh, jail ke bahar jaan uh, but for me i find uh, freedom in the jail because because you are in jail because you have to train yourself to be more patient because there's no other way you know um you know just because you want to go out they're not going to let you out they'll keep you in as long as it is needed so therefore you have to deal with your irritability your aggression your um, you know agitation agitated mind and once you s- slowly start to deal with that mind then you find freedom so i find freedom inside the jail not outside and also one of the things because as an activist uh, you know sometimes you don't get a train ticket um, and you you have to urgently go somewhere Uh, so without train ticket you are buying um, a chalu diba uh, train uh, ticket and then you don't get a seat so you uh, spread your newspaper on the train floor and you sleep uh, using your shoes for your pillow uh, and then not minding it and still feel that you are healthy that's good enough to, and uh, and you are you are grateful for that for your health and and that at least you have a uh, you you got a got into the train itself is is great and you're going to be reaching that place on time you know being grateful in 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 so many different ways and enjoying uh, your life in in small pleasures i think these are these are ways i found uh, freedom so uh, for me there is the internal freedom that i'm talking about um as a as an individual and also there is the freedom of tibet a political freedom of of tibet from china Uh, from chinese occupation you know this is a, this in in a much larger picture we are talking about the political freedom which will in uh, uh, you know eventually come it will come to a point of time where china will have to go back to their own country just the way the british empire collapsed and they had to go away when the british empire 
collapsed after the Second World War, when the Britishers were living, you know, India because of our uh, because of the partition, because of the civil war that was going on, India had to ask British Empire to hold on for some time and not leave immediately. You know, so so situations change. The freedom will will come eventually, but. What is the point in being angry and agitated till that moment of political freedom? So, freedom for me uh, for Tibet is having freedom now uh, to be free from your uh, anger, hatred, um, and and if possible, how much ever uh, from greed. I think these are these are freedoms that you enjoy now, and of course in future. So these are small tricks um, as an activist I wanted to share. Um, yeah, so I think I've spoken uh, quite much. Uh, we are now 6.40. So I've spoken for almost about 40 minutes. Um, at the end, I'll read one more poem. And then, uh, and if there are questions, uh, we can discuss. Yeah, um, those who are in, uh, in the chat room, you may post your questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, or maybe uh, you can switch on your uh, mic and you can ask your questions uh, or post it on the in the, in the chat box. I'm going to we read one. Have a lot of and, um, yes, sorry, what, Abhilash? We already have a lot of questions. I will be reading them out to you, sir. Okay, okay. So you have a list of questions. Okay, so I'm going to read one more poem and then uh, we can discuss. Here is a poem. Uh, it's This one is called Exile House. Um, <clears throat> this was a poem written um, um, out of this concern, uh, the, the poet's concern, that we, uh, the Tibetans living in India, in free country, we seem to be, you know, um, getting complacent about the situation and the freedom here, and we we, we may forget to go home, you know, as <laughs> an uh, exaggerated concern. But uh, sometimes I do feel that we should be doing much more than what we are already doing. Um, and, and therefore, the poem is a kind of a reminder to, to ourselves to, uh, as Tibetans that um, uh, we have to do more and we seem to be settling down. So this poem is called Exile House. Uh, there is one Tibetan word used here, and I'm sure it's a common experience with many of the um, bilingual poets, writers, that sometimes you feel this expression, particular word, word is is said more importantly in that native language uh, so i've done that uh, a word called changma now changma is a middle height uh, tree um, uh, you know in one way a type of willow tree which in tibet is usually planted on the on the fences uh, to fence around your house or your property um, in the tibetan refugee camps very often people do this um, so that's Changma. So I'm going, I'm going to read this poem. It's, it's a short one. So Exile House. It says, Our tiled roof dripped and the four walls threatened to fall apart. But we were to go home soon. So we grew papayas in front of our house, chilies in the garden and Changmas for our fences. Then pumpkins rolled down the cowshed thatch, calves trotted out of the manger, grass on the roof, beans sprouted and climbed down the vines, money plants crept in through the window, our house seems to have grown roots. The fences have grown into a jungle. Now how can I tell my children where we came from? So, the, so this concern, uh, you know, it'll be it'll be a tragedy if if Tibetan refugees uh, forget to go home or do not get to go home. Yeah. So for that, uh, Tibetan freedom movement must be led by Tibetan people. We must make that decision, and in and and we have to work constantly, relentlessly, and things will change, and we will we will get there. Um, uh, in the Tibetan community, uh, there are there are many uh, writers, 
um, um, I'm 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 um, one of the few uh, writing in English. But even today, most of the Tibetan writers they write in in Tibetan language. Um, and actually, I should say, majority of the of of the Tibetan writers they write in Tibetan. There are a few who are writing in English, and uh, some of my own uh, friends uh, like Tsirimwang Motomba, Tenzin Diki, Pujungdi Sonam, Tsiring Namgyel, yeah. Uh, Thiring Lama, Kesang. There are many who are, uh, and my uh, our our youngest uh, writer is Tenpun. They're all writing uh, in English. Um, but when we were in school, we used to look up to that first generation of Tibetan intellectuals and writers who were writing in English. So uh, that uh, in in that rank were Dawa Norbu, Jamyon Norbu, Thiring Shakya, Gelpo Thiring, Tenzin Sonam. So these were the people who used to write. Um, who, who studied in India, educated here, and then got into writing. So they were the first rank of uh, Tibetan intellectuals writing in English. So for me, I'd always, uh, you know, read their writings, and from childhood, from from school, I always wanted to be in that position to to be writing. And therefore, one of the things that I uh, found uh, really taxing, really really difficult um, uh, as a writer, is is um, having to translate the Tibetan experience into English. Um, because the Tibetan language and English language are just the opposite. Um, when you when we translate, what happens is the, the placement of the subject, object and and um, uh, and the and the work is just the opposite. When we translate we see um, in order to translate a Tibetan sentence we uh, into English, we need to start from bottom. Because in Tibetan language, very often, the object comes first. In English language, subject comes first. And very often, the, the, the I or he um, uh, in English language comes first, in, in Tibetan second. So you know, now you see how difficult uh, it, it is for a Tibetan to, to learn and understand English. Um, and with Hindi, problem kya hai ki Hindi mein, uh, it's it's a gendered vocabulary and it's the gendered subjects and therefore gendered uh, verbs. Tibeti bhasha mein gendered nahi hai, stirling pulling nahi hai. So therefore, you know, in order to understand Hindi, you need to first categorize the entire vocabulary. Uh, kya computer karta hai ya karti hai? Kya mobile phone karta hai ya karti hai? So, उससे मार खा लेते हैं सो द हिंदी भाषा यू नो सबसे मुश्किल वही है कि भाषा ही बहुत अलग है तो तिब्बती भाषा भाषा जो जो तिब्बती भाषा बोलते हैं ओ वो हिंदी सीखने में इतना तकलीफ हो जाते हैं लेकिन एक एक कॉमनलिटी हिंदी भाषा और तिब्बती भाषा में कॉमनलिटी क्या है कि हमारा अल्फाबेट्स है वो करीब-करीब सेम है हिंदी में जैसे हम क ग ग ग च च ज ञ त त द न है ना same way we have a uh, Tibetan lineup. But recently I found out in Malayalam, Malayalam has almost about 50 uh, odd number, 55 or 56 an, uh, number of uh, alphabets. You know, one of the largest number of alphabets. Tibetan is at uh, 30. So I found out that there is a similarity with Malayalam also. So those of you who, who speak or uh, write Malayalam, you say with me, and Jinko Hindi Ata Abi Apna uh, alphabets and Ameris Hat Bolna. Meris Hat Bon Mabi Tibetan alphabets may Abi Bolunga. So Ab uh, Hindi alphabets Sat Me Bolna Kaga Gana. Or, or those of you who, you, who, who speak, uh, write Malayalam, you also say. And everybody else, whatever language you Assamese or uh, Bengali, whatever you say, your alphabets. And let us, let us see and, uh, and, and compare, at least by sound. So I'm going to start Tibetan. Ka, 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 na, cha, 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 nya, ta, 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 na, pa, 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 ma, za, 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 wa, sha, za, a, ya, ra, la, sha, sa, ha, ah. So, 30 alphabets. So, this is how, how, how it works. And now, therefore, I'm sure those of you who speak Malayalam and Hindi, aap, aapko, aap, chok gai honge. कि यह तिब्बती भाषा का वो जो अल्फाबेट है करीब करीब सेम है और संस्कृत में भी ऐसे लिखा जाएंगे क्योंकि बिकॉज़ द टिबेटन 
alphabets, Tibetan uh, uh, written script today that we use has been adapted from uh, Brahmi yeah, in the 7th century. And therefore, there is so much of um, uh, you know, similarity. And this is the script, uh, what we call, uh, Tibetan is called Puyik, or what the people in uh, Ladakh, Lahol Spiti call Boti. Uh, and also Bodhi in uh, certain parts in uh, uh, in Kuma, uh, especially the uh, Dharjula, uh, Almora, Nainital area, and in many places in Nepal, uh, Sikkim, Bhutan, they write Zonga. Uh, it's a type of Tibetan, um, and also in uh, Arunachal in Muntawang Mumba people they write uh, uh, Bodhi, uh, which is also Tibetan. So you see, there is so much of similarity and. Um, um, and recently, in the new education uh, policy, India has deleted Chinese and included uh, Tibetan. So Tibetan language is, is one of the official languages today in India because people all across the Himalayas, they speak and write uh, Tibetan. And, um, uh, and Tibetan refugees, because for us is our mother tongue, we have preserved it and we have been, uh, you know, educating and sharing Tibetan language uh, skills in uh, to the people all across the Himalayas and uh, and also uh, people in uh, Mongolia, uh, Tuva, Kalmykia, Buryat, these uh, uh, nationalities um, in Russia. And now because Buddhism is spreading around the world, many, many people uh, read and write uh, Tibetan language. Okay, so I'll stop here. Um, so yes, uh, Abhilash, shall we take the first question, please? Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. Sir, yes. Before we take up the questions, what I have received is a plethora of exciting comments. First of okay. all, people yeah. are really, in a way, pouring in their hearts out. People from uh -huh. Kerala, people from Andhra Pradesh, needless to say, people from Assam as well. Uh -huh. They are, in a way, some of them are even asking you, sir, do you remember you coming to the government school in Palakkad? Yes, yes, Palagad. Yes, yes. I've been, I've been to Palagad Government College. Yes. And the one, the most common questions which I have received is, how can you remember so many languages? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think partly because genuinely I'm in, I'm very interested in language. Um, if because I lived in uh, Madras uh, for three years, I speak uh, Tamil, and if I had that amount of time in other places I could have picked up. And also because I was in Bombay for, for a long time, um, I can understand almost 20-25% of uh, Marathi. Uh, and I, I lived in uh, Ladakh for one year, I taught English. So I can understand again a part uh, uh, Ladakhi accent. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm genuine uh, stu genuine uh, student of language. I love languages. I love to learn new languages also. Um, so there's great joy in, in learning new languages. Um, and also because of my traveling, I traveled all across the country. Um, I still haven't been to Manipur and Mizoram, uh, but I've been to Tirupura, um, uh, Assam, Meghalaya, Nagaland, up to uh, Arunachal, and in so many places. I still have to go to Manipur, uh, Manipur and uh, Mizoram. Other than that, I've, I've traveled all across India. And also my writing, has taken me to 20 different countries around the world. Um, and some of my writings have been translated into uh, those uh, languages and in different other places also. Yes, so second second question. Mr. Shomit Ghosh says, how does a sense of freedom in poetic writing can be arrived? Is it through memory or something else? Huh, I think it's a, it's a process for me. Uh, freedom, whether it's the personal freedom or freedom from fear uh, to write, because very often people have this, what we call, you know, writer's block. The fear that you are not able to churn out good writing, and therefore you don't even indulge in it. So there is also need to fear, uh, you, know, you know, need to liberate yourself from such, uh, such kind of fears. And also understanding fear. You know, sometimes you just have a fear. You don't know whether it's coming from your mind or threat or a memory uh, or a dream. You don't know. So, uh, as I was saying earlier, try to write at that moment. Because when you try to write, you are constantly analyzing. You will find where that fear is coming from. 
And once you are able to recognize the fear, you will know how to deal with it. So this writing is also a path to freedom. Chitra Dasgupta Madam says, any poet feels strongly about some, something before writing. What was your objective stimulus before writing The Rain in Dharamsala? Yeah, <laughs> I think that that day, you know, which uh, triggered this writing, uh, When It Rains in Dharamsala, it was such a tragedy. You know, what happened is, I had gone to McLeod, a friend of mine um, from Bombay had come and he was staying in my room. And in the evening, th that it rained throughout the day that day. It was torrential rain. And I couldn't even come down, uh, you know, from McLeod down to Lower Dharamchala. I live in Lower Dharamchala. So when I stepped into my room, I stepped into a pool. I was, I was shocked that my room had turned into a pool. And my friend who had come from, uh, from, from Bombay, helplessly was sitting on my bed like a Buddha. And I said, Yaar, it, 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 pani ho gaya. Ki, kya karega? Pani bhar gaya hai. I had given my bed to him and I was sleeping on the floor on a mattress. My mattress, papers, uh, the pillow and books, all of them are gone just wet. And they, it had literally become a water pool, like a lake in my own room. So, it that at that moment, I was not thinking of poetry. I'm just worried about how to sleep that night. <laughs> you know, I was like, My mattress had soaked so much of rainwater in it. And also, this is not rainwater, tapak tapak. It's a rainwater that had come from outside seeping out from below the walls because these these are old walls yeah british time kind of a building um old old bungalow so so much of rain i think it was the next day when i uh, thought about it um it was such a poetic moment that you are entering your own room and you feel i have entered a lake and my friend was sitting on my bed like a buddha so therefore uh, so in, in my poem, I'm saying I sit, I sit on my island nation, uh, you know, which is which is now the bed, yeah, and watch my country in flood, notes on freedom, memoirs of my prison days, letters from college friends, crumbs of bread and Maggie noodles, rice, sprightly to the surface, like a sudden recovery of a forgotten memory. Now you see, uh, so you know, uh, what is the poet doing? Who was sitting on the bed was my friend. And in my poem, I've made myself sitting on a bed because it was almost the same kind of a situation. Yeah. So it's a really funny situation for me. Comic elements for me, comic element is so very important in telling the story. When you, you even when you are telling the most tragic story, I would never want to uh, cry. Know what I want people to uh, 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 I would want them to cry. I would make people still laugh at it, understand the human situation. And um, I think this is my, my poetics. Um, um, I, I bring in a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, comic sense, um, at the same time, tell the real story. And uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm adventure minded. So I, uh, whatever I'm writing, it sounds like an adventure. It sounds as if it, uh, an adventurous thing happened. It it happened in real. Uh, so that's, I think, my, my writing style. Yes. Adita Roy, Madam asks, does the choice of any lingual medium determine the beauty of a poem? Um, I have not attempted uh, writing in, uh, in other languages. Um, I, I had written in Tibetan, but my, my, my written Tibetan doesn't come out so well. I'm not too satisfied. Uh, so uh, what I'd written in Tibetan many years ago, they are still there. Uh, but these days, when when I when I feel like writing or what uh, something when I when I when I feel inspired, I think the natural uh, vocabulary, the nat natural expression, uh, comes in comes in English. So so that becomes the uh, the. The, the, the choice and um, uh, whether it's poetry or um, 
or or prose you know constantly what is ringing in my mind is is just english yeah and and one of the things um, i want to share uh, with 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 aspiring writers or even those who are already writing you know write, writers are people who are writing constantly in the head every moment there there isn't a single moment when you are not writing so you're constantly testing how does it sound like this how does it sound like that in this structure in this reverse uh, sentence structure choice of uh, letters which this uh, um, you know new idiom and the and the phrase that you're writing uh, how does the how does the imagery uh, you know uh, sound does it is it appropriate enough you know so and also um, the uh, the 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 constancy you want to maintain um in in the imagery whether it's about about rain and wetness or air and lightness or hard and strong and wood and, and rock you know so you 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 want to maintain that so all the test is constantly happening in your mind so when you actually write um in pen and paper that's only the translation the main writing happens in your head at least that's my experience yeah okay avilash second la, second next question yes sir sanjita madam says sir don't you think the periphery of our mother tongue is quite small when we compare it to english which is a global language how can we have a larger audience while writing in our mother tongue okay um i think or i i do not really think um in the scope of english language being used by so many people and countries uh is the scope your scope or whether you write in any of the indian languages or in in my, in, in my community in tibetan that is the scope all writers really shine in the world of your own language um so uh, one cannot compare um uh, uh when when you write in english you know you uh, you consider entire world a scope um i think we all uh, our our language world um, is the is the world we live in um of course there are translations uh, possible uh, but your language world um, is your scope and um there are there are for example pablo neruda writing in spanish and becoming extremely uh, popular in in english language and many other languages also yeah um so these 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 things are these things are there yes um yes next question yes sir rosy madam says please give us some suggestion to write poetry ha huh. um i think um one of the reasons why we are uh, unable to or um, we we think i cannot write or even understand is we are way too habituated and regimented by our day to day common day language yeah and we have to be aware that i am stuck in a very regimented prosaic language or once you recognize this then you will start to uh, liberate yourself okay this is one language i am stuck into can i can i try different language and then if you start to read poetry with this awareness then that poetry will stop being unintelligible yeah very often people say i cannot understand poetry it is beyond me because you are stuck in your prosaic language and you are not going beyond that you are not allowing yourself that so uh, it's in the similar way you try understanding poetry um uh, because poetry is written in a language of imagination there are many many disconnected things and therefore uh, when you read poetry you think how is it that possible how is that exaggeration possible how is that comparison possible yeah um uh, for example just earlier um in one of the sentences i was saying i walked into a lake when i stepped into my house you know it's not a lake i have exaggeratedly saying that i have 
I felt as if I wa- walked into a lake. Yeah. So, so these are these are uh, disconnected, illogical worlds. But these are uh, imagined worlds. And once you start to uh, familiarize with this, it is possible to not only understand but also write in that language of uh, imagination, which is poetry. There yes. is also a second part, sir. Is it easy to express our feelings on pen and paper when our knowledge of language is so scattered? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> There are there are two elements in this. Firstly, uh, the scattered language, as I was uh, speaking about earlier, uh, even in Hindi, for example, आप बॉम्बे जाके देखो, बॉम्बे में जिस तरह की हिंदी हिंदी भाषा बोले जाते हैं, वो तो इतना अलग है, जिस तरह की हिंदी बिहार में बिहार में बोले जाते हैं, या लखनऊ में, या मध्य प्रदेश में शुद्ध हिंदी बोले जाते हैं, तो बॉम्बे की हिंदी लगेगा यार ये ये कौन सा uh, Gandhi Hindi hai. And so and also uh, the, the 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 Tamil that I speak, you know, uh, Tamilians from Vilupuram, Salem, Madurai, they'll say, as a vulgar Dakti Tamil and Tamil and vulgar Tamil. So they say things like that. So of course within the language there are so many different types, varieties and uh, subcultures also. Yeah. So uh, the scattered na- nature of the cells in a language is not just that language but many uh, in in the language of the urban milieu the language uh, of the travelers the language of the media the language of technology <laughs> the language in the villages the language in the uh, what is called the third tier cities uh, like bhopal or indore you know so there also the language is very different so um, so not just uh, different languages Within the language, uh, there are these sub uh, regi- uh, sub languages, which is which can be called uh, registers. Yeah, uh, so that element is there, and then the language of imagination is completely different. There, you you talk uh, in the language of imagination. You are using metaphors. You are using music. You are using using uh, theater language. Yeah, that's a completely different language. So, um, as a student of language. Whether you are studying or writing, um, understanding this inner landscape of the language is so very important. Ritu Fukan Madam says, what is the definition of poetry for you? Is it the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings or something else? No, I refuse to be drawn into this definition of poetry. Um, it's um, it, it's not possible to define uh, poetry in, 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 in any way. Uh, what I can talk about is what poetry does, as I spoken earlier, um, and um, the scope of poetry and how poetry can be. Okay. Yes, sir. Rosni Verma, Madam, says, Sir, have you written poem about the pristine beauty of Tibet? Um... I've no, I don't have a poem as such to describe uh, Tibet, uh, but I have one poem uh, which which talks about the landscape between Tibet and uh, Ladakh in one of my poems uh, called um, a Personal Reconnaissance, uh, where I'm talking about my journey uh, uh, from Ladakh uh, into Tibet. Um, there, there is a mention um, in this poem. Uh, it says, from Ladakh, Tibet is just a gaze away. They said from that black knoll at Dumse, it's Tibet. For the first time, I saw my country. In a hurried hidden trip, I was there at the mound. I sniffed the soil, scratched the ground. And listened to the dry wind and wild old cranes. I didn't see the border. I swear there wasn't anything different there. I didn't know if I was there or here. I didn't know if I was here or there. They say the Kyangs come here every winter. They say the Kyangs go there every summer. 
Um, so you see, um, there is mention of Tibet there, the landscape also. Um, but once you come to Ladakh, you don't see difference. You know, you are here standing in Ladakh and the land on the other side is just the same here. Uh, so I think that is the beauty that, you know, uh, there is no distinct, um, you know, landscape on the border. Um, uh, but Ladakh itself is so very different from rest of India. Whether even in Himachal, the lower lands in Himachal are lush green and plain, and so much, so much of vegetation. But once you uh, go beyond Manali, uh, towards uh, uh, once you cross Rotang Pass and go into Lahore, Spiti, and then Kinor, and then into Ladakh, Zanskar, you know, you come to a completely new world, and real Tibet actually looks like that. And uh, especially the Western Tibet, but uh, Eastern Tibet, it's grassland, you know, hundreds of kilometers of grassland in green grassland. And, and um, you know, although I'm born in India, educated here, after my graduation, I went to Tibet. I've seen uh, the Tibet, you know, awe inspiring uh, Tibet. Um, so I'm think I'm, I'm sure things are going to come out in, in, in future writings. Yes. And Antara Madam says, Sir, do you think too much editing kills the soul of a poem? Um, I am I'm someone who uh, edit um, a poem so much. I edit so much. Um, but I think um, there is also this, this self who knows what I want at the end of the day. I may be editing and editing. You know, I'm, I'm a very difficult writer. I cannot write fast. I cannot uh, write, I cannot report, uh, and therefore I cannot be a journalist. I have to write and uh, edit and shape and, you know, I have to constantly uh, adjust. And, and therefore, for me, writing is a constant process of editing. I'm, <laughs> I'm improving on this and, uh, and it comes to a point where sometimes the, the entire thing changes. Yeah, but... Uh, you are you are not adversely unhappy with this uh, so therefore you uh, say to yourself to some point that i have to continue um or i'll say okay this much Ab ho gaya hai, yahan rakho. otherwise it's going to be uh, completely a new different poem it happens um but then what is called the killing the poem um it's it's a fear uh, that if you do uh, too much of tinkering with your poem, it may happen. Yes. Then, sir, there is a question from your friend, Manu, sir. Okay. Yes. Yes, Manuji. <laughs> he asks, what is ah. your energy behind such writing? Is there any role played by his holiness, Dalai Lama? Um, I think uh, for me, his holiness, the Dalai Lama, has been someone who had always been awe-inspiring in my life from childhood uh, from the times I started to write and even today um, he inspires me to work on my idea of freedom uh, freedom which is not just political freedom uh, freedom which is uh, genuine freedom uh, from from inside how do you free yourself from your anger your hatred your greed your uh, your um, um, just basic intolerance and, and irritability that you are you are ridden with. Yeah, um, I listen to His Holiness uh, very often um, in these um, teachings that he that he gives. Um, whether it's Shanti Deva's uh, uh, text, Bodhisattva's Path to Life, or Nagarjuna's uh, Middle Path. There are many um, amazing uh, teachings that he gives, um, and I have uh, uh, I have these uh, teachings in 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 audio form. I use I carry them in, in my mobile phone, and um, I listen to them whenever, uh, especially when I'm traveling. So he has always been that uh, source of inspiration for me in uh, in truly understanding my own problems from within and also um uh, situations that are that are around for so therefore he had always been that uh, source of inspiration and and 
that has helped me deal with my own problems, um, deal with my own writings, uh, and uh, provide me that direction. Yes. Answer answer says, who are your primary audience in the poems that you write, sir? How do you use it as a political advocacy for free debate? Huh. Um, I don't really have a particular audience uh, as such, um, because that audience uh, depends on uh, the points of interaction. Um, now, uh, internet has created complete new audience for me. Earlier, uh, like like good old minstrels, I travel to schools and colleges, civil societies, universities, and speak. Uh, so I have a new bunch of audience every other day. Um, and there, because I'm reading, I'm telling stories, my audience is on, on the journey. On the journey, I keep finding new audience. Now, media, um, internet has created complete new audience who can con continue to uh, follow some of my writings, uh, my political activism, and they uh, reading. Um, I sometimes write uh, write for newspapers, magazines. So that's a complete uh, new kind of audience. But then some of these audience are audiences are connected or interlinked, or some of, sometimes it's the same audience who who I meet, uh, like uh, Professor Manu uh, MG University, or my friend Apu John Jacob in uh, in uh, uh, in Kotayam, um, or many of my other friends in, in Assam, uh, you know, uh, my own friends like Robin Langom in, in Shillong, uh, Maitreya in Bangalore, uh, Sunaya in Bangalore, uh, my, my university friends, uh, Saurabh and Dilnaz and uh, Richa and many of the friends in, in, in Bombay, uh, they're there, they are constantly following. And my uh, college friends, Sandi, Prem Shankar in, uh, uh, in Chennai, um, and then there is also the, uh, the the Tibetan audience, the younger generation who are who who are aspiring to write uh, in English. They follow some of my writings because they think this is has been written, so they look at that and they craft their own uh, new path. Um, so, so audience uh, audience are placed in so many different areas, times, places, um, and also in different contexts. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that, that had happened is some of my poems had been um, uh, prescribed as texts in, in some colleges. So that creates a standard audience. So whether they like it or not, they have to uh, read that poem because it's part of their curriculum. Devasi Madam says, there is still fear to write on topics like corruption, especially for a woman. How can this be encouraged? I think the um, if you are meaning corruption only because of money, uh, it's a very small corruption. Though I think the biggest corruption is corruption in the mind. When you are, when your mind is corrupted, when you are quietly, for example, when you say um, I'm vegetarian or I am um, I'm I'm truthful, which is everybody says, right? I'm I'm uh, um, uh, I'm being fair, you know, you know how much character you are from inside. So just being honest, just being honest is the beginning to talk about uh, corruption. And, uh, and, and when we do that uh, introspection, you find firstly that you are the one who is most corrupted. Then you talk about corruptions in the world who are about money, police corruption, or lawyers corruption, judges corruption, you know, even media corruption, you know, planted media story, you know, company stories. So, so there are corruption in, in, in so many different places. And, uh, and very beautifully, uh, uh, in Gandhiji uh, talks about, uh, uh, about uh, corruption. So he says, um, uh, you know, Bahari uh, Sukh and Sharirik Brasht. You know, so the outer pleasures and corruption um, of, the, of the skin. Yeah. So corruption of the skin and the outer pleasures are the are the true corruptions in our in our life. And um, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, theft, theft. Uh, one of the things Gandhi uh, Gandhi says is um, 
uh, very often we think uh, corruption, uh, you know, uh, uh, theft is stealing someone else's. Yeah, Gandhi says, if you are consuming or using things that are not necessary to you, even though you bought those things with your own money, if these are luxuriously uh, luxurious facilities which are not necessity in uh, necessities necessities in your life, he says. Uh, you are you are corrupt and 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 you are stealing. So it comes to a very different idea of corruption. Um, but I think you know this idea of corruption is such a rich factor, and it's worth talking about and writing about. Yes, so we have one last question, and it okay. is a common common question from many of the participants. What does Kora mean? Is it a Tibetan word? And where can we get the book? They are extremely eager, sir. Okay, so um, so last question is the best question because I can now sell some copies of my book. <laughs> <laughs> so so this book, Kora, um, it's written in Tibetan. It's not Hindi. Kora ka gas. I snapped that Kora. <laughs> this is Tibetan word Kora. Tibetan word Kora is a circumambulation. You know that when the Buddhists uh, go around the stupa. Around a lake for uh, as a as an act of pilgrimage or as an act of worshiping, you know that is kora. So you must have seen Buddhists uh, going around, uh, for example, uh, the Kailash Mansarovar, Parikrama. Yeah, that is kora in in Tibetan. And in this book, there is a story, a fiction story, uh, which is titled Kora. Uh, so name of the book uh, comes from that story in the book. Uh, so I uh, sell this for fifty rupees. Pachas rupee, and um, and today because we are meeting online, so if you want, I can send you copies uh, from Dharamshala. Uh, you can contact either Abilash uh, with your names, and uh, he can be a uh, point of connection, and he can send me a list of uh, your names and your postal address. I can send signed copies to you, and those of you who are on Facebook. Or on YouTube, if you want to um, buy copies, uh, email me. My email address is sundu at gmail dot com. T S U N D U E. Uh, I repeat, T S U N D U E at gmail dot com. You email me, um, uh, send me your names and your address. I will send you uh, copies uh, uh, from Dharmshala. You will definitely get a copy. And um, um, and then later you can send me the money, but don't forget to send money, the the fifty rupees also, and also the postal charge, which may be about fifty forty to fifty rupees or something like. So basically, one hundred rupees you get a copy. So um, there is a very beautiful poem in the book, sir. It is called Refusing, if I am not wrong. Ha huh, ha. Huh, yes, I absolutely loved that poem. I read it last year. Okay. Sir. Okay. Let me let me read that. Uh, yeah, so please. there is a short poem uh, called yes. "Refugee." This has been prescribed in Delhi University and uh, many other uh, places, uh, um, colleges and universities also. This is titled "Refugee." Now, this this comes from uh, my memory that when when my mother tells me that when the Tibetan refugees first came to India, uh, they worked uh, as road construction laborers. They were coolies. And my mother tells me that I was born in a tent on the roadside, um, and uh, I must have been one and a half years, two years old when I started to crawl. And my mother used to uh, tie a rope around my waist and peg it on the roadside to make sure that I'm not, you know, uh, running away while she's busy breaking rocks and you know um, working on the road construction and later they uh, re got rehabilitated to south india in karnataka so when we were uh, growing up in tibetan refugee school uh, in um, in, um, in 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 kulu valley um, our teachers used to say that we are all refugees and we all bore an r on our forehead uh, r meaning refugees uh, we used to be very proud that we are all refugees and there is an R. You know why? Because our teachers, uh, uh, you know, uh, explained the idea of refugee in a very different manner. Our teachers said 
that the Indian students, for them, their chance to become heroes like Bhagat Singh, Gandhi Ji, Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, Jhansi Ki Rani, their chance is over. Now they cannot become heroes. We still have chance to become heroes because India is free and independent. And our teachers used to say, now uh, Indians, when they grow up, they will talk about their salary, their money, their home, their job. Uh, they get married, make babies, nothing else. While we, he, they used to say, while we can become Gandhiji, we can still fight for the freedom of Tibet. I was hugely inspired by just the idea that with my effort, we can make Tibet free and independent. So I was hugely inspired. And even today, I remain kicked about being the activist to, to liberate Tibet from Chinese occupation. It looks much more difficult today because of, because of China's economic and military power. But now you also see the collapsing uh, and being isolated uh, China after COVID-19 and also you know, causing that Galwan Valley massacre and all of that. Now we see China is being isolated. So, so suddenly uh, the, the hope of Tibet is, is starting to come about more, more believable. Otherwise, I used to live in the romance that hum Tibet ki azad karenge, you know, so that kind of thing. So this poem uh, uh, comes from that uh, source of uh, uh, memory and inspiration. So the poem says, uh, poem is titled Refugee. It says, when I was born, my mother said, you are a refugee. Our tent on the roadside is smoked in the snow. On your forehead, between your eyebrows, there is an R embossed, my teacher said. I scratched and scrubbed on my forehead. I found a brash of red paint. I am born refugee. I have three tongues. The one that sings is my mother tongue. The R on my forehead, between my English and Hindi, the Tibetan tongue reads, Tongzim. Freedom means transit. So now you see, uh, for me, uh, R is not English language refugee. R, uh, for me, is Tibetan word transit, which means azadi. And very often, uh, because of the uh, recent um, kind of uh, unease and difficulties in India because of the change of government and situation, uh, many People's, people are unable to say Azadi in India. So I jokingly say, Aaj Bharat mein Azadi sirf hami bol sakte hain ki wa hum Tibbat ke Azadi bolte hain. So, so, so the idea of independence um, is not just the uh, your your uh, your country, your political freedom, but it's also freedom from fear. Uh, and and making the choice and not just suffering because of that but taking pride and being joyful I feel um, that I am most fortunate that I'm born into a Tibetan and I have the most wonderful opportunity to free a country which deserves freedom from the most monstrous bully communist country uh, which is actually a biggest big, the biggest capitalist country but run in the name of uh, communism and uh, there is a there is a bully uh, you know dictator called Xi Jinping uh, so I'm challenging him uh, and 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 of, and also going to court case uh, go, going to uh, courts fighting court cases going to jail and all of that really is ex exciting uh, for me um, so I enjoy being the activist. I enjoy going to jail and I'm just hoping uh, and wishing the next uh, jail term, uh, Xi Jinping, whenever he's coming, um, I'm going to meet him again. I'll, I'll get to go to jail again. Okay, so last, I'll just, I, um, in, the, in the Tibetan uh, community, uh, you know, singing is so very important and I'm very poor in singing. And one of the one of the fears that I have fought with, you know, today we are talking about writing and freedom. Yeah, one of the fears that I've, is the fear of singing. So I've learned how to at least uh, sing a part of a tune. 
you sang last year sir yes so i i want i want sang last year in the guwahati poetry festival yes, yes, yes so i want i want to offer you that rendition it's part Absolutely. of a tibetan opera singing where it's a long lilting voice uh, which is part of the essential part of part of the opera singing so it goes like this na la ve effort i'm learning and um and slowly and maybe you know i may get a little better but i love to uh, you know experiment and um, see uh, what are the things i can do with my voice with my writing um uh with my with my little brain um these are experiments uh towards freedom so many participants want to know how to make the payment for the book Okay um you can send uh to my bank account um so uh, whoever is buying you you send me emails i'll share with you my bank uh, details at the moment because i because at the moment i have only 6000 rupees so if you send me more uh, it will help me to survive covid 19 and maybe print another lot of uh, kora and um, and continue to uh, do this uh, trade um I'm I'm one of one of these exotic uh, last minstrels you know that in bahut zamane pehle wo aise kavi hote the gayak hote the minstrels hote the wo gaon gaon ja ke kahani bolte the aur kavita sunate the aur jo bheek mein jo mile use apna guzara chalate the so I'm 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 one of those last uh, type of minstrels who purely live out of writing and live with great sense of pride and joy you are the lay of the last bit stress sir ah so my, yeah yeah uh, uh, truly living poetry yeah as my last words sir all i can say is that like last year i would again love to meet you in the poetry festival in assam and hopefully it will be very 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 soon provided that the situation gets better and sir absolutely okay. really great to have heard you and many people are in a way get in a way attached to some kind of association of your writing of your words of your living experience because the things or the topics which you write on basically are purely daily life the lived experience the mundane dealings and the way yes. you correlate and collate all of them is just all inspiring sir absolutely honored actually to be very honest with you to have yes. listened to you and it was an excellent lecture from your side and just you. okay Maybe. just one one more yeah. thing one more thing uh, now because of uh, china india problem uh, there are many uh, uh, many indian stupid supporters uh, there are new interest in tibet and in this also i'm sure there are there are some if you want to take interest in tibet if you want to support tibet uh, there are many organizations uh, you can join or uh, and use your social media uh, use your voice in writing uh, because helping tibet is helping india uh, because for a long time for 70 years india thought uh, let tibet go under china we are safe and now you know because india let go tibet under china today india is facing the galwan valley and also the 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 military who has still not disengaged and still sitting there in lipu lake in sikkim in arunachal in so many different places china is not going to go away so therefore for it is important for india to take take strong steps and indian india taking steps is not just government not just political parties people of india especially the poets and writers must take uh, that that step uh, we are a group called uh, friends of tibet friends of tibet um, so we are a group it's a it's an indian support group i'm the i'm the only tibetan in this group so we help uh, spread awareness about tibet so please visit friends of tibet website become a member and help spread awareness about tibet uh, you you will also get um, newsletters from friends of tibet and uh, you can keep working because 
ignorant India about uh, about Tibet is India's weakness. Government may want to do a lot of things, but if people of India remain ignorant, they don't know where is Ladakh, they don't know where is Sikkim, they don't know where is Arunachal, and the points where China is making inroads and um, you know threatening India when. When people of India, when they are ignorant, with them, when they do not know, then the country truly becomes uh, becomes weak. So therefore, um, uh, it is time to let people of India be aware and take steps, and then ask government to take uh, stronger steps. So with this, I want to end here. Uh, so visit friendsoftibet.org, friendsoftibet.org. Visit that website and uh, take actions from there. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And to all my dear participants, the feedback form will be posted half an hour later on the description box. Thank you once again, sir. Okay, thank you.